Listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network for short. And um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here today. This webinar is also co sponsored by openchannels.org. Org. Um, and we're very pleased to have Tim Wilkinson from the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center with us. And he's going to be presenting on the Blue Carbon Mapping Toolkit. Uh, before we turn it over to Tim, though, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Uh, so there's two ways you can raise your virtual hand. There's a hand icon in the user interface. You can raise your virtual hand, and then I'll unmute you, and you can ask the question directly to Tim. Um, we'll save this type of, of questioning for the question and answer uh, period after the main presentation. Um, and uh, this only works if you have a working microphone on your computer and you're using the voice over IP, or if you're calling in on the telephone if you dialed in your PIN number. Um, the other way to ask questions, which is also really easy, is to type them into the question panel of the user interface, and then I'll relay them to Tim. And these types of questions, uh, if you want to write them in, you can send them in throughout the webinar. Um, clarifying questions, I can uh, ask Tim during the presentation, and more substantive questions will hold to the end. So anyway, welcome everyone. Welcome, Tim. I'm gonna, uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, Sarah. Thanks, and um, welcome to everyone. Thanks for... Um, asking me to, to speak um, about the, the Blue Carbon Toolkit. Um, so just as a bit of background, um, I'm Tim Wilkins. I'm, I'm Head of Biodiversity Informatics at UNEP WCMC. Uh, and um, so UNEP WCMC is, a, is the specialist biodiversity arm um, of UNEP. And our, our mission is to provide authoritative information about biodiversity and ecosystem um, services uh, in a manner that's useful. And so my, uh, the informatics team, I, my team spend most of our time trying to support the other programs around um, the, um, the center, the, the World Conservation Monitoring Center, in that mission. So uh, we make um, web and mobile applications um, to either collect, an analyze, or, or display data and present data um, uh, in, in various forms. So that could be kind of online reporting or presenting species data. Um, and we do an awful lot of stuff with maps as well. Um, so for the Blue Carbon Toolkit, we were working, or I was working with the, the marine program in uh, UNEP WCMC, and collectively we were working with a number of partners, um, um, a GD, uh, a Grid Andal, um, and a number of others, Forest Trends, UNEP Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi as well, um, to um, build a suite of tools um, to map the, the coastal habitats of Abu Dhabi. Now, I understand that last month um, the webinar focused on the science kind of elements of this project, so I'm not going to go too much into that, but I'll um, give a little bit of background um, just so that, that, that people understand what, what was going on. So um, it's a 12-month or was a 12-month demonstration project comprising of about five different components. Um, so there was a data collection and analysis element, so um, some remote sensing work uh, had gone on which had identified um, or designed to identify a number of different uh, blue carbon habitats, mangrove, seagrass, salt marsh, uh, algal, mat, algal mats, and a number of others as well, um, which, we, which didn't necessarily progress into the tool. Um, but the idea was to get a, a baseline um, quantification of blue carbon stocks, and following that work, there was an amount of um, ground feeding work going on to um, uh, assess the quality of that work um, to, to understand how accurate it was. Um, and we were involved in that um, to a degree, which is quite unusual for UNEP WCMC. We're not normally um, known to go out in the field, um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and um, so that was, that was one component. And running in parallel to that was um, some work on the ecosystem services, so an assessment of distribution and conditions of existing coastal habitats. Um, to, to understand the ecosystem services and their local, national, and regional value. Um, a geographic component, which, um, I mean, the, the work that we did with the Blue Carbon Toolkit actually covers um, most of these strands, but, but predominantly, certainly from the outset of the project, the geographic component was the, was the primary element for us. Um, and that was the, the online carbon assessment tool for decision makers to understand the carbon stocks. So that sort of developed a bit, and I'll, and I'll go into more detail 
later about that that particular component. Um, and then there was uh, a, a number of sort of slightly wider elements um, which uh, UNEP WCMC wasn't particularly involved with, which was the, the policy element, so incorporating considerations surrounding coastal ecosystem management in Abu Dhabi's climate change mitigation and development plans, um, and uh, carbon and ecosystem services finance feasibility. So there was a real push throughout the project to try and um, do kind of outreach and make sure that um, the kind of decision makers um, in the area understood the value and the, and the work that was going on there, um, which was interesting. And again, that speaks to, to one of the one of the tools that we that we created. Um, so the toolkit um, actually kind of composed of four main components, really. Um, and uh, the idea was to help collect or help to facilitate the collection and analysis of data. Um, relating to the blue carbon habitats of Abu Dhabi. And analysis is, is a bit of a misnomer because um, whilst there was that element to it, we were also trying to um, um, uh, display the data in a way that was understandable and useful um, to a wider audience than perhaps we might normally do. So uh, again, these policy makers and decision makers, so um, you know, whether you were um, somebody working in the planning department uh, the local the local authorities or um, um, you know um, somebody um, uh, you know building in the area um, uh, or just a, uh, an interested citizen um, we were keen that people would be able to access this information and this data um, and, and get some understanding of it and I'll show you again when we get to the um, the analysis element of the project how we've how we've hopefully gone some way to achieving that um, so the main components then were the validation component. Uh, so that was to support the work um, of um, validating the, the remote sensing data uh, and um, to uh, make sure that, that we could support the guys doing the baseline assessment. So going out into the field and adding or deleting um, or, or amending um, literally the, the, the kind of geometries that, that mark the boundaries of, this, of the specific habitats. Um, and that, that was uh, an online component, or is an online component. And then the analysis component, which is this um, public-facing element of the project, um, designed uh, to allow people to explore that information. So um, through the analysis component, you can't edit data, um, but you can, you can explore it. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and sort of delve into detail. Um, uh, and then an admin feature, which is really for managing the validation component. Um, I won't really talk too much about that because really um, that element is um, sort of user management and, and those, kind of, those kind of things. So um, not massively interesting for, for this group, but um, there are some other interesting features which, which I will talk about to do with how the data is stored and, and uh, how we make sure that there's a, an element of quality management going on there. Um, and then additionally, we, we developed a, a mobile component, um, uh, which is kind of still in the development phase, um, but we can show you that uh, as well today, so you'll, you'll get a, a feeling for how that, that product worked. And, and the idea was to, to enable people out in the field actually to make edits direct, so rather than um, doing traditional ground truthing and then having to transpose that information, uh, we wanted to kind of shortcut that process. Um, so again, we'll, we'll go into some detail on that uh, a bit later on. Um, so the um, analysis tool then is the public facing um, element of the data. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of showing you this first because I think it, it sort of makes sense. Um, it's a, it's I was in some um, sort of discussion with myself about where to start, but I think if we start here and then we can work back and hopefully um, by showing you the analysis tool that will probably raise questions that then showing you the validation and mobile tools um, will answer. So we'll see how it works. Um, but uh, So we'll start with the analysis tool um, and this is the, the public facing element. So um, uh, and I'll take you through that now. Uh, so I'll just have to escape here and move across. There we go. Can uh, I'm hoping everybody can see that. Um, I'm assuming Sarah will jump in if she can't or if there's a problem. Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Um, uh, it's cut off a little great. at the bottom. We, we see up to biomass and sediments. Sometimes it rates higher than tropical rainforests. 
Okay, that's okay. I'll scroll. I'll scroll down that bit for that bit. So I'll, I'll give you a quick tour of the site, but all the action hopefully will be happening where my cursor is. If you can see my cursor. Um, so where where the big kind of blue carbon bit is, but just shout Sarah if, if things are getting cut off. Uh, um, no, we can see it just fine, and we we are seeing your cursor move too. Great. Okay. Um, so this is the, the the homepage. Really, is just an introduction to the to the um, project, and um, uh, it's worth just exploring and having a look around um, at some point. Um, and uh, there's a number of other elements, so you can there's some help and some about information. Um, which goes into to more detail about the project, but I'm going to dive straight into the um, the assessment tool so that we can start to play around and have a look. So um, you can see here on the left hand side we've got a map of basically the project site. Um, we've kind of fixed it so you, you can scroll out and move around, but you can see from um, the map here the sort of size of area that we were that we were working with. Um, and then inside here we've got all of the um, habitat layers um, for the various habitats that the project covered. So that's mangrove, seagrass, salt, salt marsh, uh, ang uh, uh, algal mats. And then we have this other classification which um, I don't think has any data in it at all at the moment, but when we were building the tool there was a feeling that um, um, we might come across something that was interesting out in the field and want to map it. So, uh, so that's, that's in there. Uh, so the idea is this: uh, that you can. Um, this is publicly available, so anyone can scroll around. Um, um, and uh, generally, I suppose most people will probably scroll to an area they know or where they live. But the hope is they'll then sort of start exploring areas that might be under development, or consideration for areas that might be under development, um, and get a good sense of the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the the habitats that are around um, Abu Dhabi. Um, and then uh, using your cursor, you, you can draw an area of interest, and I'll just I'll just choose an arbitrary one here, just to give you an idea. Um, <clears throat> and the system will then um, drill down through the database and uh, make some calculations. So, uh, and I'll explain uh, how those figures are, are arrived at. So. Um, initially, what this is telling me is uh, that my area of interest is um, 7.98 kilometers squared. <clears throat> it's done a calculation for the amount of carbon, the total carbon stock held within the habitats in my area of interest, uh, and it's listed out the um, habitats within my area of interest. Uh, and in theory, I can toggle on and off to try and see where those are. So you can just see there's some salt marsh there which is showing up. Um, there's some seagrass which is the which is the main one. And then we should, there's a tiny little bit of algal mat just in the just in the corner there. If I tick that on and off you can see. So those are the those are the three elements. So let's actually get rid of all of that. So we've got, um, uh, salt marsh and seagrass. Uh, and then you can zoom in. Oh that's a bit far. We can zoom in and explore those uh, a little bit more. Um, so what we've got with each of these um, with, e with each of these habitats is um, the the um, geospatial information, but then we also have um, a, a carbon level assigned to each habitat. Uh, and along with that, there's a number of uh, other factors um, that are recorded at the point of ground truthing. So the age, um, the um, condition, uh, and a number of other elements which we'll look at when we go into the validation tool. Um, and, and those are um, put into an equation um, which um, gives us the, the, the carbon stock elements. And you can see down here a breakdown. So It'll tell you that there's, you know, 4.66 hectares of algal mats within that square. Um, uh, a total of 0.4% of my overall area of uh, interest, uh, and it will give me a carbon stock value for the for the algal mat in that area. So it gives some some, um, you know, quite useful information uh, about the um, habitats within my area of interest, uh, and um, we've also added in an equivalent per capita CO2 emissions to try and um, make it relevant. I think it's 
it's really difficult to make that kind of jump. Um, but the idea is, that, you know, for, for somebody just kind of coming on the website and trying to understand, you know, what, um, you know, um, uh, 19,000 tons of, uh, of carbon is, you know, hopefully that, that sort of helps to give some indication. Um, and we've added some kind of usability features, so we figured some people might like to share their work, so you can cut and paste a URL, um, which will take you directly back to this area of interest. Uh, so you don't need to save it or sign in or anything, um, but if you've got that URL, it will regenerate the, the polygon and, uh, and ping back the information. Uh, and you can export the data as a CSV file as well to add into um, reports uh, and those kind of things. Uh, you can add additional areas, um, so you can do a number of areas at the same time, and you can also add polygons. So you might have three or four zones that you're looking at. Uh, and then it'll break it down and give you the details um, within those uh, within those areas. So now I've got I've added salt I've added man mangrove to the um, to the assessment. So um, again, the, the the idea with this tool is that um, you know the, the general public and decision makers and anybody really can can jump right in and start getting an idea about um, the, um, the the um, blue carbon habitats around the coastlines of, of Abu Dhabi. Um, and we hope that it's a sort of uh, engaging and, and useful product um, that, that people are able to work with. Uh, as I say, you, there's a number of other features. So you can delete, uh, you can delete your area of interest as well um, and recalculate and, and do all sorts of other things. Um, so let's just jump back to the presentation. Um, so as I said, you can, you can define your define your areas of interest. Um, you get a, a number of um, data um, returned. Um, the CA2 equivalent calculations are, um, are there in, the, in an attempt to sort of make some of the data more relevant and more understandable to, pe to, to, to people. Um, and then you can share your analysis and, and download the data as well. Um, the, the areas are obviously um, um, uh, you know, fairly simply defined um, just just by clicking. Um, there is some discussion that you know um, further developments might involve being able to add in um, uh, you know specific points. So um, <clears throat> adding longitude and latitude references and, and try to make the area um, more defined so that if somebody was working from a plan or working from a, a uh, you know something specific. They could get um, they could get much more accurate areas of interest to find within the tool. <coughs> Excuse me. So just touching on the carbon calculation um, element, then, as I said before, each habitat has a baseline carbon value attached. Um, so we start off with a as part of the other work within the project. Um, there there was an assessment of the. Um, the kind of you know we've kind of done an average carbon um, um, value um, attachment for each of the habitats, um, and then uh, in addition we're using specific attributes such as the age and the density um, to, uh, to as a multiplier effectively uh, on that figure. So um, so if somewhere's particularly dense or if it's well established, um, then you know we can work out that that the carbon value for that particular area will be higher. Um, so at the moment what we're using is estimates and the idea is that over time as we get more and more data and more and more inf um, information we'll be able to uh, improve on the data uh, and so those carbon assessments will become um, much more much more accurate so um, obviously the whole area hasn't been ground truth so there are you know large swathes of habitat that will just have a baseline in there, um, but as they're validated, um, we'll get better understanding of age and density, and as the science work continues in the background, there'll be a better understanding of how these factors influence the carbon storage of these particular habitats, um, and we can adjust the, the, the values accordingly within the application, so that, the, so that when the, um, the calculation is run, uh, it's, it's more accurate. So then I'll, I'll move on to the validation tool. Um, which is really a, a kind of um, um, the, the sort of substantive element of, of the work. Uh, and as I say, this is the, the online 
um, validation tool which allows um, the science teams and um, 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 authorized individuals to actually go in and edit and, and uh, amend the data set, um, record characteristics of habitats, and, and do some other things, for example, add photographs, um, which might help um, um, you know, when you're re reviewing and looking at the data, it will help get a better understanding of the condition and, and, the, and, the, and the state of these habitats. So I'm just going to jump back to my browser so we can go and have a look at that element. Uh, I'm logged in, so I should be able to just jump straight through. <clears throat> so um, the, the first thing a, a, um, um, a registered user uh, comes to is a list of all the edits that have been made. Um, and, uh, and it's a historical list. So uh, obviously, at some point, we just added in a load of data. Um, and then uh, on top of that, people have been um, going out in the field as part of the test, um, the demonstration element of the project um, to add and, and validate information. So um, and I'll uh, go into how that data is stored a little bit later on. Um, but for now, what I'm going to do is uh, assume that I want to do a new validation. And it works in kind of a similar way to the um, analysis tool in that we've got the same uh, base map and we've got the habitat layers um, overlaid. And I can, uh, again, I can toggle on and off habitats to reduce some of the noise. So I can kind of look at areas that I might specifically want to um, go in and work on. Uh, and I'm just going to have a look around for a bit of something that might look like mangrove. Um, I'll, I'll delete it in a second, but uh, just so we can see. OK, so we'll just, just do a little bit around there. It may or may not be mangrove, but we'll uh, sort that out in a second. <clears throat> so again, using the tool and uh, using the satellite imagery, or if I had um, other information, uh, I can draw around an area of habitat to define on the map um, what I think now is, is um, mangrove. And I can select um, what particular habitat it is. So in this case, I'm going to say it's mangrove. Uh, and I can do a number of actions to that. So I can either validate it. So um, for example, this area here, I could have drawn around this area here and said, yeah, I've been to the field, or I've got intelligence that tells me that that is um, definitely mangrove. So I can validate that element, and I can add in additional information. So as I said, the, the conditions and things. Um, I can add um, some more mangrove. So the, the um, um, remote sensing data might not have picked up some mangrove, so or seagrass or whatever it is. I can add some, and I can delete it as well. So it could be wrong, uh, and I can go in and delete that element as well. Um, and there's a number of sort of um, clever things that are going on here. If I was to draw around a whole area, so um, if I was to draw around this element here to confirm that it definitely was mangrove, I could be fairly sort of wild in my um, positioning of the area. Uh, and the application will match the two. And it'll say, OK, well, um, you know, it, the user wants to identify some mangrove. It'll do an intersection and figure out where the mangrove is within that area. Uh, and it'll just apply a, um, um, a, a field to that area to say, yep, this area is, has been validated as mangrove by the user. Um, if I want to delete it, uh, it, it stores the geometry of the deletion as a separate geometry. And then it flattens that out when it gets to the um, analysis tool. So. Um, so we always keep historical edits. So if um, if once I've deleted a section, you know, next week I discover that actually I did the wrong bit, I can go back into the admin administration element, which I'll show you in a second, and uh, and I can and I can undo that delete effectively. So we're always keeping um, a, um, a, a a sort of a, a clean copy. Um, in the database. And then what we're doing is stacking edits on top of that clean copy. And then for the public facing elements, we're, we're merging all of those to produce a version that the public sees. Um, and the reason we're doing that, as I say, is so that we can keep track of changes 
and we can uh, delete through those um, those elements uh, it should should we need to. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and add um, uh, this bit of mangrove, my pretend bit of mangrove. As I, say, I can upload a photograph as well um, if I was in the field, um, and we'll touch on that a bit later on. And I can add some um, information about uh, that, uh, some characteristics about that piece of habitat. So density. Um, uh, I can add a sort of quality element, so I can say how it is that I know that there's um, there's mangrove there, so whether I've been to the field, uh, whether I, I mean, not in this case, but I might just be, um, uh, yeah, I might just have, have local knowledge. Perhaps I was doing some work nearby and I've, I've come back and added it in. Uh, or I could just be sitting using the, using the underlying base map um, to identify it. Um, I can specify the condition of that, degraded, restored, um, or new, or, or it's been cleared. Uh, and I can add some some age um, characteristics as well, um, which, as I say, helps to um, in the calculation of, of likely carbon stocks of that of that particular habitat. Um, it prefills when it was recorded, when this information was recorded, but I can uh, amend that um, if I need to, and I can add some notes as well, which might be useful to somebody coming across this edit um, in in some weeks to come if I'm not available. Uh, so then when I save, um, it gives me a, um, a screen just to confirm the element that I've added. Uh, and I can go back and edit if I've made some mistakes here. I can go back and edit that. Uh, or I can continue on and do a new validation. So often what we found was often you know, there'll be crops of mangroves obviously reasonably nearby. And I might sit down for an hour and add a whole load. Um, following a, um, a field visit or following some other intelligence, um, so I can I can go through and and do that work. Uh, now, if I click back on validations, I get I get my table and I can see here right at the top um, this latest um, this latest validation that's gone in, uh, and it will tell me what type of edit it was, what type of habitat it was, and I can filter by users. Uh, and as you see, I can also delete that. Um, I can also delete that element. And in theory, it would be interesting actually whether I can find. I should have. I should have chosen somewhere that was uh, easy to find. Because in theory, let's just. I'm just going to jump on that uh, and then zoom out and see if I can identify it. Um, so what I'm going what I'm going to do is just see if I can look. Sometimes it takes a second for the mapping tiles to update, and it looks like that's what's happening here. Perhaps I've been a bit too ambitious. Um, uh, but uh, is that why we, we're in the right area? Um, yeah. So that edit will show up. Uh, it might take a. It'll take a minute or so for the. So what's happening is the from here the the um, geospatial data is pushed up to the cloud-based geospatial database. That's being processed, and then um, the. Um, um, public facing version will then pull that information when it's ready. Um, so it'll just take a second to process, but it's it's usually relatively um, relatively quick to come through. Um, so if we just just jump back to validation, so uh, that's there, and as I say, I can delete it. Um, what we've um, what we've actually done with the deleting element of the tool is. Um, uh, allowed at the moment you can only delete the last sort of four or five edits um, so that um, uh, so that it doesn't get too um, um, disjointed so in theory you can it's like taking um, sort of slices of bread off, off a loaf from the top as you work through so you can't suddenly take a slice out from the middle which might impact on um, the layers around it you have to kind of peel them back one by one uh, for any given habitat 
Um, so you'll see there, you can take the last, the latest edit off the mangrove, latest edit off Sabka, salt marsh and seagrass. Um, so that uh, it doesn't sort of shuffle the pack too much. Um, uh, but we have all that data there, so in theory we could go into the database and edit something that was very old if we needed to. Um, okay, so I'll just jump back to the presentation quickly. Um, so as I say, we can confirm and add habitats, or we can record characteristics of those habitats, uh, and, uh, and we can add additional data as well. Um, so just to touch a bit more on the, the way the data is stored, and I'll, I'll um, talk about the, the kind of technology infrastructure in a second. Um, but uh, as I say, essentially the edits, um, the edits are all stored in a geospatial, a cloud-based geospatial database, uh, and we store all of the, the attributes as well as the, as well as the geometry. Uh, and as I say, they're stacked up. So this master data set is always clean. Um, so at any point, you can extract the data um, um, really at any given moment. Um, and there's a, there's a, I'll just very, very quickly. So there's an export function. So I can export export uh, any one of the um, habitats um, uh, individually, and then using um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Esri or, or um, QGIS or something, I can merge those layers back together. Um, so I've got a good record of all the data. Um, and, uh, and as an administrator, I've got a record of all of, the ha all of the edits as well. So at any stage, I can go back and change the data and, and see what's, what's, what's different from the original master data set. Um, so again, when I'm when I'm deleting areas of habitat validations or, or validations, um, I'm not actually uh, changing that um, that master data set. All I'm doing is specifying that there's a particular area of that that has been marked as deleted. So when it goes out to the public facing site, it'll have a chunk taken out of it. Um, but as far as the master data set is concerned, it's untouched, and we're just recording a geometry as a deletion. Um, over the top of a particular habitat. So, here's, so the, the technology that stack then is um, uh, so we, we built almost well we put all of it in Ruby on Rails and we're using a, a Postgres database to store the the the, the well uh, yes yeah, sorry a local Postgres database to store the user information and then a cloud-based geospatial database to store um, the rest of the information. Um, and then in the front end, we're using um, just standard web technologies, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Uh, we use Leaflet for the mapping component, which is nice and flexible and was um, um, really good for the mobile component, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, and it's just we tried to kind of keep it as lightweight as possible. Uh, and um, the, the, the geospatial database we're using is a product called CartoDB, which um, I'm sure many of you have kind of come across. Um, and we work with them quite a lot, actually, because um, we just find it a really useful tool. And they have a really great API, which allows us to um, to work with um, the geospatial data in a in a quick and, and flexible way. Um, and it also means that you know, even without having the um, mapping, um, sorry, without having the um, blue carbon toolkit interfaces, you know, you can go in and explore the data. So it's got a um, it's got a cut it has got a, a, a front end a friendly interface which um, allows us to go in and just really interrogate and play around with the data and, and has kind of off the shelf capabilities that would um, take a long time for us to develop to develop you know bespoke for this project um, and this kind of technology stack um, made it really um, much more uh, easy for us to approach the mobile um, element. Um, which was kind of an add-on to the project. So we saw that there would be a need to create a mobile version of the assessment tool um, for use in the field, um, which presented a number of challenges. So, for example, we, we couldn't be sure that we would have um, um, mobile signal. Um, the type of data is, is heavy, particularly the, the base map tiles are, are heavy uh, in terms of their, their kind of data usage. Um, um, it's likely that multiple teams could be out in the field at the same time using the product. 
um, so it would need to handle multiple edits. And then, I mean, really the main point was we wanted to try and cut out the, the sort of burden and, and potential for human error of transposing, um, you know, transposing from, from paper-based methods um, into the database. So the idea was that, you know, you'd be out in the field using this tool, and the second you had a Wi-Fi signal or a mobile signal, um, the, the data would automatically be updated. So I'm just going to see if this works. I'm going to take you through um, uh, using the tool. So just just quickly, we in order to handle the um, the fact that multiple teams would be working on the project at any given time, we defined um, project sites. So I'll just just play through the video, and you can see. So on the left hand side there, we've got um, specific project sites. So as you tap on one, you get taken to an area that you might work in. So um, each uh, each um, version of the uh, or each iPad that has the software um, or is using the app um, would be using working in a different field site. I'm going to stop that second. Oh, I'm going to stop that for a second. Uh, we'll be working in a different field site. So um, by having field sites defined like this, if somebody's working in a particular field site, that's locked out to the rest of the iPads. Um, uh, and then when you finished your when you finished your work, um, the the uh, application automatically understands that there's been a change to that data set, and therefore you can see where it says download. Therefore you have to download the latest version before you can go back out and start work. So in that way, there's a um, a kind of a very basic version control. So we're trying to avoid this situation where somebody is. Uh, editing old data. So I go out into the field, I make a change to a piece of mangrove, somebody goes out into the field two hours later, doesn't know I've made that change, and, and does a change themselves, and then you get conflicts. Um, so in this way, we're, we're, we're kind of handling that. So I'll just step through the video. We'll have to do that first bit again, unfortunately. Um, so a user can choose their project site. <clears throat> and then when they're ready to go, so when, they, when the application knows that it's got live data, it, you can click start trip. Um, and in this, in this scenario, um, they've added some salt marsh already. Um, but you can see just like on the um, web-based application, you can zoom into an area uh, and um, toggle habitat layers on and off. And you can do this, you know, as I say, standing out in the um, in the field, uh, and then you can zoom in into a particular area um, to identify it um, and start work. It's also got a geolocate function, so um, you can you can up in the top right hand corner you can press the press that that icon and it will show you exactly where you are within a within a within the map. So you can actually use it to walk around uh, a, a habitat in order to um, define that area. And then just again, as, as on the um, web-based application, you can, you can define characteristics uh, whilst you're standing in the field. And it repeats back to you and says the area that you've just worked on. And you can delete, if you so wish, um, the area you've worked on. And then when you're done, you can hit upload the validation. Uh, assuming you've got a mobile signal, it will then push that uh, out to the cloud-based um, geospatial database. So um, just looking ahead over the next year, we've got um, plans to, um, again, working with GD to, to expand the project zone to include um, Dubai. Um, and um, we're excited to be involved in the uh, next phase of Jeff Blue Forest work um, to expand the toolkit for use in Indonesia, Madagascar, Mozambique, and Ecuador, and, and also do some, some further work on the mobile uh, element, which will be made use of in all of those countries, as well as the, the UAE as well. Um, so we're excited to kind of keep moving this project forward. Um, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed being involved with it. Um, and, uh, um, and as I say, we hope to we hope to further develop it because I think there's there's lots of opportunities for application elsewhere. Um, so thank you very much, and I guess questions will start now. Great.
Thank you so much, Tim. This was this was great to learn more about the, the toolkit. And I also want to compliment you. Uh, in uh, the early days of this webinar series, we had lots of live demos, but we haven't had that many lately. So um, I'm very uh, glad we, we you were able to do a live demo for us. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. You can type them into the question uh, panel, and I can relay them to Tim, or you can raise your virtual hand. Uh, Ted. Your hand is raised, but I don't think you've put in your PIN number for the phone, so if you do that, then I can go ahead and unmute you to ask. Okay, so let's see. Some, so if some of the questions came in earlier, and maybe I should have interrupted you or not, but at any rate, uh, they refer to the early parts. Um, and one was the calculation is for carbon stocks, but not sequestration rates. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's just for... Um, it, yes, it's for, for uh, how much carbon would be lost if you if you got rid of that area of habitat effectively. Okay, right. Thank you. Um, another question that came in relatively early: Is there any option to look at mangrove density, so number of trees per area or, or meter? Um, does it have any impact on the analysis? Um, so. Um, yeah, the the um, at the moment the, that's one of the characteristics, but it's it's quite broad. So we have to sort of define parameters. So um, there's a there's a, um, a percentage density really. So it's it's just broken into quartiles. So it's very basic, um, but that does that does have an impact on the analysis. Okay. Right. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and Norman, if you wanted to sort of follow up on that, please send up any additional questions along that line. Um, so, okay, another comment. Uh, very impressive. How robust are the biomass data? How does one access the underlying metadata? And also it includes above ground biomass and not below ground, correct? Um, so actually, let's go with the first part. Let's just go part by part. Um, how robust are the biomass data? Uh, okay, so they, that's kind of moving slightly out of my field, um, but um, uh, the, it was as a result of um, uh, guys working out in the field um, uh, for a number of months taking samples, uh, and, and, and that went away for analysis, uh, again, ab above ground and below, below ground biomass. Um, in terms of the, the sort of the science and how robust it is, um, the, the best thing to do actually is to look on um, both the, the website that I showed you originally and, um, and Grid Arundel set up a um, Blue Carbon portal site um, which will give you a lot more detail in, in much better than I can to be honest in the, in the, the kind of scientific methodology um, around, uh, around those, that assessment. Okay, great. Um, let's see. And um, how does one access the underlying metadata? Um, so that's uh, that's not publicly available at this stage. Um, so behind all of this, obviously, there's um, uh, we've we've got that we've got that metadata, um, but it's not it's not publicly available. So. As an administrator, you could uh, export the database, uh, and that information would be available. Um, and uh, but, but as I said, so publicly, it's not accessible. Okay, great. Um, and uh, the last part of that question um, also does it include above ground. It includes above ground biomass and not below ground biomass. Correct. It's both. It's both, as I understand it. Okay. All right, um, so that is contrary, uh, James, to what you, the assumption, okay, your assumption, okay. So let's see, uh, another question, is there any consideration of calculating uncertainty in the carbon stock estimates? Um, uh, it's, it's, I mean, uh, in, um, in terms of what, because we, I mean, uh, it's, we're, we're certainly we're certainly well aware of the limitations of the calculations. Um, uh, so, um, and, and one idea taking the project forward is to add a quality score, um, which would have an impact. Uh, yeah, so which would 
um, allow you to make a, a sort of assumption about you know how, how good the data is. So it, where where an area was kind of uh, heavily ground truthed and a lot of information was collected, and we were pretty certain about the, the, the kind of carbon stocks, it would get a higher quality score, and that could be based on a number of factors. We've discussed very early on about um, that that quality score being, uh, for example, um, um, affected by whether you were out in the field when you took the measurements and the recordings and those kind of things. So, um, so as I say, the idea was initially that if if um, if there was um, assessment data to back up just the basic kind of visual, you know, yes, this is mangrove, yes, it's pretty dense. Uh, and I think it's you know however many years old, then that would have a better quality score than 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 if there wasn't. Um, but that hasn't been applied at the moment. Okay, all right. Thank you, Tim. I think that answers that uh, pretty well. Um, there was another question: uh, Who owns these areas of study? Um, so do you mean do you mean who physically owns the land? Yes. Yeah, do you mean who owns the data or? Who owns the land? Um, I just recall well, the land. Yeah, um, it it varies. Most of the areas of study are owned by um, the, um, Abu Dhabi or the um, 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 the royal family. Actually, around obviously because it's a principality, so owned, owned by the royal family. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean the the, the obviously the the um, remote sensing just covered the covered everything. There are certainly areas. I mean, I was out there um, testing the tool and doing some ground treating, and there's certainly areas that are not publicly accessible for various reasons. Um, but yeah, it's a mix. I'd say predominantly it's owned by Abu Dhabi and the royal family, uh, and um, and then there's industry involved in there as well. Okay, thank you. I mean, there's also kind of public parks and things like that. Okay, and then they had asked if there was public land, but uh, it sounds like there is uh, some public yeah. land as well. Okay, now this question had come in early on in the presentation, and maybe if you just uh, speak generally on the, this topic. Um, what are the assumptions in designing this tool for analysis on carbon capture? Um, um, so uh, when you say it's um, uh, assumptions for um, carbon capture, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I mean, we, um, we, we, we've obviously there are opportunities to do that, and it would be uh, that might be an extension um, of the way it works. But this this particular piece of work was about just understanding the the current carbon stocks. Um, uh, and I, I think it would be a, a kind of a whole other level of analysis to understand the, the capture potential. I suppose is that what, what, what you mean? The, the capture potential of, of uh, the carbon. And again, that's not really my field, but uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that answers the question that it, it, it's not for carbon. Ca it's not uh, looking at carbon capture, and yeah, would require a lot more. Uh, would be a, a lot more work. Okay. Um, let's see. Another question: If using this tool um, in a new location, would the team need to m make new habitat-specific carbon biomass measurements, or would they be limited to using those measurements now in the database? Um, well, it depends on the size of the area, obviously. So we can extend the project zone. So if there's um, uh, if there's remote sensing data for other areas around, and for example, if we expand it to Dubai, we'll start by putting in um, a, a new data set for the habitats that, that covers those project areas. Um, but um, again, yeah, I mean, if, you, if it's, if it's uh, in theory, you can do this anywhere in the world. We've, we've limited the tool specifically, but there's no reason why you know, you, you couldn't start mapping. Actually, when we were prototyping the tool, we were mapping mangrove in a car park in Cambridge, which was obviously highly inaccurate. But but the point is, you, you can kind of go anywhere and, and just and, and add data where relevant. Okay. 
Great. Uh, that's all that we have for questions right now, Tim. So uh, we'll okay. go ahead and end a few minutes early, but uh, this was great. I, I really enjoyed learning about the tool. And um, if anybody has any questions, um, hopefully they'll get in touch. Uh, can you flip back to, or is there any contact information in case anybody uh, had any yes. specific questions they wanted to? Let me do that. So you can great. Yeah, Perfect. email me. Or, or put a, great. Okay, great. We really appreciate you doing this, uh, Tim. And, and thank you to everyone who was able to attend today, and, and happy holidays to everyone. And uh, we'll hopefully see you on, on further webinars. Great. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's great.